started a series uh, entitled Burning Questions. If you have one, uh, there's a QR code that's going to be up on the screen. We'd love for you to ask it. Uh, again, I cannot guarantee that we're going to get to all of them. Um, but if you'd like, uh, you can ask the question, and we will definitely do our best to try to get to them and answer them. Um, you can also, in a little bit, my email is going to come up on the screen, and you can write an email to me, and we can have dialogue through that as well, um, and would encourage you to do that. Again, the expectations are is that you will always take whatever I say or whatever has been said from the pulpit or from anywhere and take it to Scripture. You need to always be comparing what you're hearing out in the world and what you're hearing from other people who say they're Christian. You need to take that to the Word of God and say, is what they're saying lining up with Scripture or is it not? And again, understand, most of the time, everything is just the tip of the iceberg. It's the iceberg principle of just the, it's just the what we see above the water, and oftentimes there is a mass, a massive mass underneath the water that we cannot see. And so uh, it is more about us diving into Scripture and understand that our responsibility is to dive into the Word of God ourselves, ask the Holy Spirit of God to lead us and to guide us and to teach us, because that's what He does, and know that as He does, He will lead us into all truth, not part truth, not some truth. He will lead us into all truth. And so we can know that as we go to him, he has the answers for us. Be willing to ask. Be willing to seek answers. There are answers for the questions that you're asking. And understand that, that we want to try to help with that. And so again, my email is up on the screen. We'd love to have conversation with you. And uh, it may mean uh, even getting together face-to-face, and I'm quite all right with that. Um, thank you. Some of you have done that and been willing to do that and uh, even even push back a little, and I'm, I'm so thankful for that. Be willing to do that. That's okay. Um, and, uh, and, and so thank you for being willing to, uh, to dialogue. Three truths that you need to know, um, and, and number one is this. Uh, I love you. God loves you. Will you turn to somebody and tell them God loves you? God loves you, God, and then tell them this, God wants his best for you. Tell them that. And then tell them this, we don't have to agree. We don't have to agree, but we can still be friends. You can tell them, unless you can't tell them because it's your spouse and you're having an issue. Uh, I don't know. Um, but but you, can, you can look at him and say, God loves you, he wants his best for you, we don't have to agree, and we can still be friends. Uh, we can still be in relationship. That's the principles, that's the things that you need to grab hold of and understand. So today's question, today's question is this, can a Christian lose their salvation? Can a Christian lose their salvation? I need to ask this, and, 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 and I want... And, I, and if you're willing to be honest, um, I, I, I'm wondering how many of you have ever, ever asked this question about your own life, have ever been asked this from someone else, you're wrestling with your own salvation, you're wrestling, or you have wrestled with your own salvation, you've struggled with doubt, you've struggled with, with assurance of your faith, and, and, and or you know people who are. Is there anybody in here that would say, yes, that's me? All right, leave your hands up, please. Y'all look around because you're not alone. You're, you're not alone. I have two. You are not alone in how you feel. You're not alone in what you're wrestling through. You're not alone. Why do we need to know that? Because so often we feel like we're alone in that feeling. We're alone in that struggle. And, and that is Satan telling you that. Satan is, again, trying to isolate you away from the herd, and he is, is, is the master of deception and trying to get you to trick you into thinking you're not really saved, you will never know that you really can be saved, and, and, and you, see, you've messed up, so you're not really saved. You did this thing, so you really don't have a relationship with God. And, and I need you to understand you're not alone. God knows that you're not, he loves you, he cares for you, and, and please look around, see that, you know what, you are not alone in this. Can a Christian lose their salvation? Number one, 
I, I, I'm assuming what you mean is, is not losing it like car keys or a wallet. Like, I mean, I, anybody else struggle with losing their car keys and wallet or some other important item that you, you know, misplace? We're not talking about misplacing something. I, I, I assume what you mean is, is they once had it and now they no longer have it. It's gone. It's, it's out of their life. They, they had it, but now it's gone. Can a Christian lose their salvation? The other thing that we need to um, make sure we understand is, is what do you mean by Christian? When you say the word Christian, what do you mean by that? It's always important to define the terms. Because I, I imagine if I went around this room, there's like a couple hundred people in here, and if I even asked online if you, for you to put comments in, and I were to say define what it means to be a Christian, there is a whole lot of different ideas out there of what it means to be a Christian. And there's a whole lot of people who say they are a Christian. So what does it mean to be a Christian? Is a Christian someone who has said a prayer, walked an aisle in a church, grown up in a church family or a Christian family, attended or is even a member of a Christian church? Is that what it means to be a Christian? The answer to that is no. For some of you, you're shocked right now. Because you have always thought, well, wait, I grew up as a Christian in a Christian family. I am a Christian. No, you're not necessarily. Well, I went to church. I've gone to church my whole life. That's good, but that doesn't mean you're a Christian. Wait, wait, I, when I was five, I prayed a prayer. I'm not a Christian? No, not necessarily. Are all of those things potentially experiences that you might have as, as a part of a Christian experience? Yes. But do any of those things actually save you? Do any of those things actually redeem you from, from your sin? Did any of those things pay the penalty for your sin? So, so what is a Christian? A Christian is a person who has fully trusted in Jesus Christ as their only Savior and therefore possess, they have the Holy Spirit of God living in them. If you have a piece of paper and a pen, you are gonna, if you don't, you're going to want to grab one. I'm giving you a plethora of verses. Like, How many of you grew up in the church and you did sword drills? Some of you all know what I'm talking about. This is the sword, and when we did a sword drill, we would say a verse, and we would say it, and then everybody would go to try to find it as fast as they possibly can, and then whoever found it as fast as they possibly could would stand up and read it for the entire place. I'm not going to make you do that today. <laughs> so you're like, oh, oh, I was about to have a panic attack. He's going to make me get on front of church. No, I'm not going to make you do that today. Um, all right, so ready? Here we go. Romans chapter 10 Verses 9 and 10 and verse 13. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Verse 13. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Titus 3. Four through six. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, He saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Lord. Notice in both of these verses, the emphasis is not on you. You are not the primary focus of these verses. The primary focus of these verses is God. Is what Jesus Christ, God the Son, has done on your behalf 
for you. He is primary in all of Scripture. You, my friend, are secondary. Yes, you confess. Yes, you believe. But it's only because of Jesus. It's only because of God, the Father. It's only because of the Holy Spirit working in tandem that you even confess your need of God. That you even believe that there is a Savior who paid, his, who paid your penalty for your sin. The emphasis, the primary focus is on God. Are you depending on God? Are you looking to God for your salvation? Not depending on yourself, not depending on other people, not depending on a prayer, not depending on your church attendance, not depending on your baptism, not depending on whatever family you grew up in. All of those things, while not bad, all of those things will not save you. None of those things will save you. The only one who saves you is Jesus. Jesus only. Now, does that mean you're going to be perfect? If you put your faith and trust in Jesus and you, can, you, you, you confess him as Lord and you believe in your heart that he is who he says he is, does that mean that you're always going to, from that point on, be perfect? Uh, n- <laughs> no. Anybody else in here uh, struggle like day to day, you 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 have a you have a relationship with Jesus, but you blow it, like all the time on the way to church. When you pulled into the church parking lot, while you're walking up to the church, and you saw somebody standing out there, you're like, "Oh crud!" I mean, <laughs> let's just be real. I mean, not the two guys that were standing out there; those guys are awesome. But I'm I'm just saying, maybe it's somebody else that you saw walking across the parking lot. And they're like, <sighs> they go to this church. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> not perfect. Does it mean that if you follow Jesus, everything's going to be rosy? Oh man, yeah, it's just, it's awesome. Everything just is so great all the time. It's wonderful. Nope. Does it mean that you're not going to at times mess up and fall short of the glory of God? Yeah. You're going to. That's why the emphasis can't be on us. It has to be on God. Because God is perfect. God works all things together for good. Even the messy stuff in our lives. God God doesn't mess up. God doesn't fall short. God never makes an error. So some of you need to hear that today because you feel like you're an error. You feel like you're a mess up. And God's going, "Mm -mm. you're a daughter of the king. You're a son of the most high. You, my friend, I created you in my image. I love you. I care deeply for you. No matter what you've done, no matter what you didn't do, didn't change my love for you. I still love you. And I gave my son so that you can demonstrate and see that love. You're not a mess up. You didn't pop out and God went, oh, boy, that's a mess. No. I mean, I may have been, been a mess, but no. No, you're not. You're not. So what's a Christian? A Christian is someone who's fully trusted in Jesus as their only Savior and professes Jesus Christ, and they have the Holy Spirit of God. So with that definition in mind, can a Christian lose salvation to crucially important question, and we're going to dive into five, I think it's five, one, two, three, four, five, thank you, five, uh, different areas, things that happen. The moment, think about this, the moment you put your faith in Christ, these five things happen. Now, I will say this, you probably do not become aware of them at that moment, there's a thing called growth in a Christian's life that, that happens over a period of time. And, and the reality is, is that it happens over your entire lifetime. If you, have, if you have gotten to a place where you think you have arrived, you have not. 
there is still more to learn about your relationship with God and who God is and, and how he wants you to live. But these five things happen the moment you put your faith and trust in Christ. Number one, a Christian is a new creation. 2 Corinthians 5.17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. A Christian is not simply an improved you. Are you listening to what I'm saying? A Christian, when you put your faith in Jesus, he is not just improving you, he is completely changing you. He is completely making you into a new creation in your soul, in your, in your heart, in your spirit. You have become a new creation. You have been given a new set of wants, a new set of desires, a new set of longings in your life. You have become something new, not an improved you, an all-new you. And that is a beautiful and incredible thing that happens the moment you put your faith and trust in Christ. For a Christian to lose salvation means that that new creation would have to be completely destroyed. And you don't have the power to do that. You cannot undo what God has done in your life. You are a new creation. The moment you put your faith in Christ, a Christian is a new creation. Number two, a Christian, at the moment you put your faith in Christ, is redeemed. 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19. For you know that it is it was not with perishable things, in other words, things that can die, things that can fall apart, things that can that that won't that won't last. It's not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your forefathers, but listen to this, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. What does it mean to be redeemed? It means to be purchased from a old way of life, a dead way of life. Jesus Christ redeems you from death to life, from darkness to light, and he wants you as a child of God to understand you're no longer on the path to death, you're no longer on the path to darkness, you are now on the path to life and light. He has redeemed, he has purchased you with his shed blood, and that, my friend, is not perishable, that is imperishable, and that is straight from Christ himself giving of his life so that you can have life and have forgiveness of sin. The moment you put your faith in Jesus, you are redeemed. Number three, the moment you are putting your faith in Christ, a Christian is justified. Justified. Romans 5.1. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified is a legal term, and it means this, to declare righteous. All those who receive Jesus as Savior are declared righteous by God. Here's another way to say it. Just as if I never sinned. How awesome is that? You look at your past and you go, oh man, there is so much mess in my past. The moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus, Jesus justified all of that and looks at you and says, I, that person that I'm looking at is just as if they never sinned. That's how he, God sees you. How awesome is that? That's how God looks at you as a justified individual. If you were to lose your salvation, God would have to go back on his word and undeclare what he has previously declared. Those that have been absolved of guilt would have to be tried again and found guilty. God would have to reverse the sentence handed down from the divine bench. You have been justified just as if you'd never sinned. Number four, a Christian is promised eternal life. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him 
Well, what? Shall not perish, but have what? Eternal life. Turn to somebody and say, eternal life. What is eternal life? Eternal life is the promise of spending forever in heaven in the presence of God. And we get to see, we sang about it earlier, we get to see Jesus face to face. That's the promise that God makes with you. And if you believe, you have eternal life. For a Christian to lose their salvation would mean that eternal life would have to be redefined. It would have to be redefined, for the Christian is promised to live forever. Does eternal life not mean eternal? That's number four. Number five. A Christian is marked by God and sealed by the Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13-14. You also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth the gospel of your salvation, when you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. At the moment of faith, the new Christian is marked and sealed with the Holy Spirit of God who is promised to act as a deposit, guaranteeing your heavenly inheritance. The end result is that God's glory is praised. Think about the beauty of that. The moment you put your faith and trust in Christ, you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, and he is a deposit, a guarantee of your eternal life. If a Christian were to lose their salvation, God would have to erase that mark, withdraw the spirit, cancel the deposit, break his promise, revoke the guarantee, keep the inheritance, forego the praise, and lessen his glory. Again, five things that happen at the moment of your salvation. A Christian is a new creation. A Christian is redeemed. A Christian is justified. A Christian is promised eternal life. And fifth, a Christian is marked by God and sealed by the Spirit of God. I would contend this. A Christian cannot lose salvation. A Christian cannot lose salvation. Most, if not all, of what the Bible says happens to us when we receive Christ would be invalidated if salvation could be lost. Salvation is a gift of God, and God's gifts are irrevocable. In other words, he won't take them back. He won't take them back. A Christian cannot be unnewly created. The redeemed cannot be unpurchased. Eternal life cannot be temporary. God cannot lie on his word. Scripture says that he does not lie. Titus chapter 1, verse 2. Now, there's some of you that may be thinking, wait a minute. What about, okay, there's two Two things, two different individuals that oftentimes people bring up when it comes to losing your salvation. Number one is, what about the Christian who lives in a sinful, unrepentant lifestyle? And number two is, what about the Christian who rejects the faith and denies Christ and walks away from everything Jesus Good questions. Thank you for asking. The problem with these objections is that we make an assumption that everyone who calls themselves a Christian is actually a Christian. When when you hear somebody say, I'm a Christian, you make an assumption that they are. Can I just tell you, as and I was a youth pastor for 20 years, I made that assumption a couple times, and after that, I stopped. And the reason why is because I had 
two students in particular that would look like they acted like they said that they had a relationship with Jesus. We went off to uh, a, on a mission trip or a camp or something to that effect, and I remember these two kids specifically. They came up to me after everything, and they were like, PJ, I, I just want you to know, I put my faith and trust in Jesus tonight. And, and I'm like, you know, I, of course I got excited, and I was, you know, excited for them. But in my mind, I'm going, wait a minute, I, th- I thought you were. I thought you already were. So I asked the question. I was like, I thought you were already. Yeah, me too, but come to find out, I'm not. But I am now. Sweet. So here's the thing. And, and, I, and I don't mean this to be negative or I don't mean this to be whatever. You can, you can take it. That, don't Please don't. It's not that. I, I'm not going to assume any longer, ever, that just because someone acts the part, plays the part, even says the part, that they are the part. Just not going to do it. Number one, I'm not the judge of a person's soul. I can't tell. I can look at the outer man. I can look at the outer person and see, oh, wow, they got X, Y, Z together, but they didn't have all the other letters together. They didn't have C-H-R-I-S-T together. By the way, that spells Christ, um, I think. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, so here's what happens. It actually validates Scripture, which is kind of sad, but it's true. The Bible declares that a true Christian will not live a state of continual, unrepentant sin. Do you know that? 1 John chapter 3, verse 6. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. sinning. No one who keeps on sinning, listen to this, and this is so key, has either seen him or known him. What, what does that mean? That means they have never seen God. They have never known him. They've ne- never. They missed it. A person who lives in continual, unrepentant sin, the Bible says they have never seen him nor known him. The Bible also says that anyone who departs the faith is demonstrating that he was never truly, she was never truly a Christian. 1 John chapter 2, verse 19. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that it might become plain that they are, they all are not of us. What what does that mean? Underline that. They would have continued with us. You don't just up and quit the faith and reject Jesus if you truly are born of the Spirit of God. If you really have a relationship with Jesus, Yes, there may be moments where you're questioning your faith, where you're doubting. There may be times you're going through struggle and you're trying to understand and you're trying to get questions answered and all that sort of stuff. But if you truly turn your back on Jesus, have no more to do with him, I would contend you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ in the first place. But here's the deal. I don't get to make that call. I am not God. And so I need to extend grace to individuals who do that in their lives. I need to be loving to them. I should never slam the door shut on an individual who is saying that to me. Let them do the job of slamming the door. I'm going to do whatever I have to do to keep my foot in the door because I'm not God. And I don't know what God is doing in their life. 
So I am not going to stop extending grace and mercy to them when God has not stopped extended grace and mercy to them until they have blasphemed the Holy Spirit, which means that they have died and they have said, I don't want Jesus, I reject Jesus. They cannot be forgiven for that. Once you die, if you have rejected Jesus your entire life, my friend, the Bible is clear, you will spend eternity separated from God in hell. I don't like that doctrine, I don't like that teaching, but it's a reality of the book, and it says there are consequences for the choices that we make. And it's not God's will that any one of us should die and go to hell. That is not God's desire whatsoever. That's why he sent Jesus, so that we don't have to die and be separated from him. Again, the emphasis of all of these passages is not on the person, it's on God. Every one of us, secondary, is the choices that we make. But aren't you glad? <laughs> aren't you glad that God is bigger than our choices? He's bigger than our choices. He's bigger than our mistakes. He's bigger than our sin. I love Romans 8, 38 through 39. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Praise the Lord. But it doesn't end there. Nothing can remove a Christian from God's hand. John chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Woo! What an amazing God we serve. And it gets better. Jude. Yes, Jude. You're like, there's a Bible book called Jude? Yes, there is. Jude, verses 24 and 25. To him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and, without, and with great joy, to the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. I don't know about y'all, but that's the God I serve. That's the God that I look to to keep me secure in whatever it is, this beautiful relationship that we have. He's the one that's big enough to keep me. He's the one that is big enough for me to trust. Not my understanding. Not my questions. It doesn't depend on me. It, it's all dependent on him. Am I depending on God? Am I depending on God? I'm going to ask you to close your eyes by your head. Aaron is going to come and lead you in a song that's going to be one of our theme songs. It's called Abide. Y'all might just, as I was listening to this song, it's one of those songs where I just needed to keep my eyes shut and just worship God. If you're a visual learner, I get that. Some of you all are, and that's cool. You need to see the words. Um, that's why I love Spotify, because it gives you the lyrics and stuff down there, too, so you can read them if you're a visual learner. So if you need that, that's cool. The words are going to be on the screen. Before we get to that, though, listen, some of you here are being hit with the hard reality that maybe you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You've been depending on your upbringing. You, you've been depending on the church that you attended as a kid and then maybe even as an adult. You've been depending on a prayer that you said. You've been depending on, on a whole lot of other things, but you haven't been depending on God and specifically his son Jesus to transform your life. And it's hitting you right now, and you're going, I need Jesus. 
Brother, sister, can I just say to you, I get that. I grew up in a godly home. I went to a church that preached the word of God. I prayed a prayer when I was five. But I remember in January of 1992, I was, I was 18 years old. And God was knocking on my heart's door. And he's saying, let me in. And I knew that there was something missing. And what was missing is not the head knowledge. I had that. But I never had had a hard experience with Jesus. And y'all, I let him in. And he transformed my life. And I'm here today because of that work that Jesus did. So today, maybe, maybe that's you today. Maybe you're here today and you're going, you know what? I know I need Jesus. Maybe you're here today and, and this is the first time you've ever been challenged with, do I even know Jesus? Listen, my friend, today, every single one of you, you can put your faith and trust in Christ. And, and those things that we said, those are only five, by the way. There's a whole lot more that happens when you put your faith in Jesus. <laughs> those are the five biggies. That can happen today. You're like, dude, I, I want to know. How do, how do I know? Well, I say this all the time. It's as easy as ABC. A, acknowledge that you're a sinner in need of a Savior. B, believe that Jesus is that Savior who paid the penalty for your sin and he rose again to give you eternal life. And then C, confess it. What does that mean? It means to agree with God. And you can agree with God in, in the quietness of your heart. You can agree with God through a prayer. A prayer doesn't save you. It's Jesus that saves you, by the way. So if you're here today and you're going, wow, that's, I need to do that. Right now, you can do that. In a moment, I'm going to pray. Because some of you may not, you're like, I don't even know what to say. I'm going to pray. And the only reason I'm doing that is just to help you to be able to confess it to God. I can't. I can't make your heart want to believe it. I can't make you, you want to believe it. But I can help you pray. I can do that. So if you're here today and you're going, I need Jesus, I want Jesus in my life, I'm going to pray this prayer. You can pray it quietly to yourself. Dear Lord Jesus, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. And I know I need a Savior. I believe that Jesus is that Savior. I believe that he died and paid the penalty of my sin. And he offers to me eternal life. Jesus, I'm saying yes to you right now. Come into my life. Begin a relationship with me. I want to know you. Friend, Eyes closed, heads bowed, no one looking around. It's just me and God. That's it. That's you. You prayed that prayer today and you said, yeah, I'm saying yes to Jesus. Can I just ask you to raise your hand and keep it up? I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to make you come down or anything like that. Thank you. 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 I just lost count, but anyway, it's a bunch. Y'all can put your hands down. Y'all, a whole bunch of people just said yes to Jesus. Can we get excited about that for a second? Yes. Friend, thank you for being willing to say yes. Welcome to the family. You're a child of God. Daughter of the King. Son of the Most High. You said yes. We rejoice in that heaven is going nuts right now. <laughs> going nuts up. That's the Bible tells us. When one comes home, the, bo- the whole of heaven rejoices. Y'all, a whole bunch of people just came home. We want to help you grow. Like I said, it's something that, that, yes, it happens right in that moment, but you learn about how that becomes reality. We want to help you grow. There's something for you to help you grow. It's at the Welcome Center. It's called a, it's a packet that says, I said yes on it. 
please stop by and pick that up. Please tell somebody. Tell your friend that you came with. Tell, tell me. Tell somebody else, maybe one of these folks that are standing up here at the front or at the back during this song. Tell somebody. That's an important part. Tell them. It just makes it concrete in your life, in your heart. Friend, if you're here today and you say you know Jesus, you ask God to speak to your heart. What's he saying? What's he telling you? Maybe for some of you, you you have one of those two people in mind. A prodigal. And and it's hurting you to the core. And God's saying to you, don't slam the door shut. Sent, be grace-filled, be merciful-filled, be loving. Yes, speak the truth. I don't know. I don't, I get that. I, I, I really do. If you don't think it doesn't break my heart. I've been here 29 years and so many people I've watched walk away. And praise God, there's been so many more that haven't. Don't get me wrong. So many more that have said yes and kept saying yes and keep saying yes. There's been so many. But it breaks our hearts for them. But God, help me to be loving and kind and compassionate toward them. Help me not to judge. I'm not a judge. I'm not a jury. That's your job, God. That's not mine. God, you know the hearts of each one of us. And I pray that we would, as Aaron's about to sing, choose to depend on you, choose to abide in you, because without you, we can't do anything. There's nothing of any spiritual value that we can do apart from Christ, but I love the fact that with Christ, all things are possible, all things. So God, I believe those prodigal children, I believe those prodigal friends, they can come back to you, that you can get a hold of their hearts and you can transform their lives. God, please, please do that work in them. Give us the right words to say. Give us wisdom in how to react and act, how to respond when everything in us, our flesh swells up in us and we want to just lash out. God, help us to hold our tongue. Help us to take captive every thought and commit it to Christ. Help us to be willing to be a demonstration of Jesus to them, no matter how hard it gets. Thank you for your love. Thank you that you've made a way for us to abide in you. As Aaron sings this song, like I said, you may just want to keep your eyes closed and you want to lift your hands up and worship, that's cool.